All right, so chapter 22 is about um, evolution and Darwin's role in describing the theory of evolution, um, which is known as with descent with modification. So the new era of biology um, is th thought to have begun when Darwin published his theories behind evolution, the origin of species. Um, which kind of examined the diversity of organisms and his belief that they were descendants of ancestral species. Um, and so evolution in th can be defined, according to Darwin, as descent with modification. We can look at it both as a pattern as well as with a process. Um, so his um, ideas on evolution challenged a lot of traditional views. There was a lot going on during Darwin's time about Earth and how it was inhabited by species that were not changing. Um, and we'll get into some of these um, scientists as we go throughout this presentation. So Aristotle looked at species as being fixed. I do not speak Latin. He arranged them on a scala natura um, the Old Testament holds that species are individually designed by God and therefore perfect. Linnaeus um, looked at adaptations that organisms um, developed as evidence that create, the creator had designed the species each for a common, a specific purpose. Um, and Linnaeus, uh, furthermore, was known as ta um, for taxonomy, um, how we came up with our classifications of organisms and develop that binomial format, the binomial nomenclature that is used to name species. Fossils were um, being examined um, helped to provide foundation for Darwin's ideas. Um, these are often found um, in sedimentary rock, um, which will appear in what we know as layers or strata. Um, paleontology um, was a study of fossils, or is a study of fossils, and it was developed um, in large part by Georges Cuvier. Um, he um, was an advocate for catastrophism, that the boundaries that were present between um, each of the strata uh, were due to some sort of catastrophe that had happened on Earth. So there you can see the sedimentary layers, um, that the more recent layers have recent fossils, the older layers have your older dated fossils. Hutton and Lyle um, both were geologists and they felt that changes in earth surfaces were due to um, slow actions that are continuing to happen today. Lyle actually um, developed a principle of uniformitarianism that says that these mechanisms of change are constant over a period of time. And both of their ideas um, were significant influences on Darwin's thought process. Lamarck first hypothesized what he thought evolution was, um, that species evolve through the use and disuse of body parts, um, that their behavior will change and how they use their bodies uh, will change as well in order to survive, um, and that acquired characteristics are inherited. Um, that if an organism changes its um, activities um, in life, um, whether it uses um, body parts, it disuses them, changes behavior, dischange, um, leaves behavior alone, that those get passed on to their offspring. Um, so the idea of life changing obviously is still thought to be true, um, but that an organism can stop using something and will then just pass on that change um, to its offspring, not so much. That is not supported by evidence. So descent with modification helps to um, better explain how organisms can adapt um, to survive and reproduce and the connections among living organisms um, and then as well as their diversity. Um, so there definitely were some doubts about species being permanent throughout life. Um, and as Darwin grew up, he became more and more interested in nature. Um, he studied medicine at first. That was not a successful endeavor. He then looked into um, religious studies at Cambridge. 
Um, he graduated from there and took a position as a naturalist um, and accompanied Captain Robert Fitzroy um, around the world for five years unpaid on the Beagle. And he traveled all over the world on the Beagle. He collected specimens um, of lots of South American plants and animals. He made some observations that fossils um, seem to resemble living species from the same region and that living species in one region resembled living species in other regions. Um, he had the opportunity to, uh, to experience an earthquake while in Chile and observe the rock movement. Um, and again, he had the opportunity to um, be influenced by Lyle and his studies of geology and the, the thought how uh, the age of the earth. Um, he became more interested in the geographic distribution of species when he stopped at the Galapagos Islands west of South America. Um, his thoughts were that species from South America had colonized the Galapagos and then went through speciation on the islands. So there you can see his travels. Um, and then the Galapagos are that box that is underneath North America and to the northwest of South America. And you can see the different islands making up the Galapagos Islands. So with all of his observations in mind and his um, studies and just the knowledge that was out there at the time, he perceived adaptation to the environment and the development of new species as being related very closely to one another. Um, and based on the studies that were conducted when he traveled to the Galapagos, um, biologists um, now have concluded that that truly is what must have happened with the Galapagos finches. So we have finches with different size and different shaped beaks, um, depending on their food source, cactus eaters, insect eaters, and seed eaters. So when he returned from his travels, he wrote an essay on natural selection as um, the mechanism of evolution, the descent with modification, but he didn't um, publicize um, this theory uh, to a great deal. Um, so natural selection is a process in which individuals that have more favorably inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce, according to Darwin. And about 14 years later, he got a manuscript from another naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, whose natural selection theory was quite similar to Darwin. And then Darwin finally got around to publishing The Origin of Species, and his work was published pretty closely to the same time as Wallace's um, because his data um, had existed for a longer period of time. He's given credit for the idea of evolution via natural selection. So Darwin's book, um, or his manuscript on the origin of species, um, focused on three broad observations, both the unity and the diversity of life and the connection between organisms and their environment. He did not use the word evolution when he first wrote The Origin of Species. He used the phrase descent with modification, um, that organisms are related through a common ancestor um, that lived in the remote past. And that life's history is basically a tree with lots of branches and each of the branches are basically showing you the diversity while the tree is showing the unity. So his theory did end up meshing well with Linnaeus's hierarchy in terms of how he organized um, organisms into kingdoms and phylums and now we have domains. So here you can kind of look at um, just a breakdown based on a timeline of similarities um, between um, organisms. And we have other things that have kind of come up um, from Darwin's work. Um, artificial selection um, is actually something Darwin first brought up in that humans have made modifications um, they have not allowed things to occur naturally by selecting and breeding individuals with desired traits. Um, and so when that occurs, you will see um, change occur more rapidly. Um, but that in general, um, when you have members of a population, the traits that they inherit will vary. 
um, that more species will be produced than um, the environment can support. Um, for our offspring produced from species often are in greater numbers than the environment can support, so not all of them are able to survive and reproduce and produce their own offspring. Um, the individuals, he thought, who had inherited traits um, that were able to better survive and reproduce in an environment are the ones that are going to produce more offspring than those that are not. And because of that difference in offspring reproduction, um, that's going to lead to an accumulation of alleles in that population over generations um, that are more of alleles that produce um, proteins that are going to provide those individual organisms within the population um, a better chance to survive and reproduce. Um, his ideas were influenced also by Thomas Malthus, who said that human population um, wanted to grow and grow and grow and grow, but that it was limited in part by um, a competition for resources such as food. Um, if heritable traits are advantageous, um, he thought that they're going to accumulate in a population over time. And so individuals with um, those more desired traits are going to increase in frequency over time. And um, so we can kind of see that connection with organisms and their environments. So the individuals that have um, heritable characteristics um, that are more favorable are going to survive and reproduce. Over time, um, as the environment changes, um, organisms will adapt, um, and the ones that have the more favorable traits are going to be able to survive and reproduce and pass on those traits. Um, and if there is enough of a change in those traits, um, you may have speciation occur where a new species forms. It is not individuals who are evolving, it is the population who is evolving, the population that is evolving, excuse me. Um, natural selection is only going to have a change in the um, amount of those desirable traits, um, and those are, but you're still gonna have a variation of traits within a population, and environmental changes are going to lead to adaptations. There is a lot of scientific evidence that supports this idea of evolution. Um, obviously, at the time when Darwin did his work, that was just one, um, one set of data that had been collected by an individual. Um, we're going to look at a couple other examples right now um, when a new plant species is introduced, as well as when um, bacteria and viruses are going to evolve um, as a result of what they have been exposed to. So the first one we're going to look are soapberry bugs. Um, they use their beak to feed on seeds within fruits. Um, in southern Florida, they feed on balloon vine that have larger fruit, so therefore they have longer beaks. In central Florida, they don't have those um, balloon vines as available as frequently, so they feed on golden rain tree that have smaller fruit and their beaks will be shorter. Um, we've seen a correlation between fruit and beak size in other locations as well. Um, the beak size has evolved in populations that feed on plants that have fruit that is a different size than their native fruits. Um, in Florida, we saw this occur in under 35 years. Um, but again, it's not instantaneously. It does take time um, because of the different size of the food source, um, the beak size um, adapted to that new food source and evolved over time. Um, we also can see this again with um, bacteria and viruses. Um, we're hearing a lot about this right now with coronavirus. Um, so Staphylococcus aureus is often found on people. Um, there is a um, strain of it that is pretty scary. Methylicillin resistant Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus MRSA. Um, it is resistant to several antibiotics, uh, both penicillin and methicillin. 
Um, and because they um, both of, methicillin works by inhibiting a protein that is used in the cell walls of bacteria. MRSA bacteria don't use that protein. And if they are exposed to it, they actually are able to grow more rapidly. Um, so if you have a bacterial infection that is um, produced by Staphylococcus aureus and is one of the MRSA forms of Staphylococcus aureus, um, the doctors tend to take care of that a lot more quickly. Um, and there are a lot more precautions put into place, a lot more cleaning needs to be done, um, disinfectant, bleach, things like that, um, because can't let this one get out of control because we can't treat it using what we normally would do. And so this bacteria has adapted to be able to survive and reproduce in the presence of environmental factors that are trying to limit that possibility. Um, so natural selection doesn't create new traits. Um, it does as a result of what um, the species have been exposed to um, result in changes in frequencies of traits um, being expressed, um, being selected for or selected against within a given population. Um, so some other evidence that we have is with homologous structures. Um, we see homology um, is coming from individuals with common ancestry. They have anatomical resemblances um, so that we can kind of can see where there are similarities between very different organisms um, based on what types of anatomical structures they have present. We can also see this with embryology. Um, so this is not something that we could physically see through skeletons, um, through bone structure, but this is something that we could see um, by looking at tissues and things along those lines, what types of proteins are being made. We also have vestigial structures. Um, these are ones that might have served important functions in an ancestor, but don't necessarily serve an important function in that particular population at this time. Um, we see these both um, along structurally, and we can also see them genetically speaking. Um, but that kind of helps us to see connections between um, individual species and how similar or how distantly they are related to one another and to their common ancestor. So evolutionary trees are hypotheses that attempt to describe relationships among different groups. Depending on what is your source of data, you will have different types of evolutionary trees develop. Um, it'll just depend on what's being used to analyze um, those individual species. Um, they're going to form nested patterns. And again, they can be made but using physical data, anatomical data, or they can be um, made using genetic data, DNA sequences. So here we are looking at homologous characteristics. And so when you have a branch, that's the, that particular trait was the last one they had in common before they divided. Um, and so you have your tetrapods separate from your amniotes, separate from your birds. And these are, depending on what is the source of your data, um, these evolutionary trees are definitely um, subject to change. But here we would say the lungfishes are most distantly related to the hawks and the other birds, while the ostriches and the hawks and other birds are most closely related to one another. Um, they had all of these other traits in common, the, the digit bearing limbs, the amnion, the homologous characteristics, the feather, um, those are, sorry, not the homologous, the homologous characteristic is what's being marked by the amnion. Um, but the three that are noted there, they had all of those in common, but then they divided after that point. So what could cause um, species to look more similar to one another than we would expect? Um, convergent evolution is when we have an analogous features, similar features um, that are seen in distantly related groups. Um, these are not due to homology. Um, these just happen to be traits um, that these individual groups of species have adapted to independently 
based on their environment. Oftentimes they might be in similar environments. Um, so although they might physically or outwardly look similar to one another with convergent evolution, they don't necessarily have an ancestral relationship. Um, the fossil record um, is able to help us to identify um, when species were extinct, when new groups formed, and when changes formed in those groups over a period of time. So there's a way for us to record um, key transitions, such as when um, animals moved from land to sea. Um, so there you can see some of the bone structure. And here we have kind of another one of these um, evolutionary trees showing um, when these different species um, were able to break apart or were separated from one another. And then finally, we have biogeography. Um, this is another way that we can provide evidence of evolution, looking at the geographic distribution of species. Um, the continents on our planet were um, initially united together in Pangaea, but have separated since then through continental drift. When these continents moved and where the species are located gives us um, information we can use to predict um, the location and at what time different groups evolved. There are species that aren't found anywhere else, um, and those are known as endemic species. We often find those on islands, um, and but we will find that those species that are endemic um, tend to have pretty close relationship to species um, nearby on other islands or on the mainland. Um, so Darwin's explanation for this with the Galapagos is that species on islands um, that were carried there through travel um, or as the um, continental drift occurred gave rise to new species as they underwent adaptations to their new environment. So again, theories attempt to explain and integrate a lot of data that has been collected. They are not statements of fact. Um, they are experimental. And as a result, as new information is gathered, they could be disproven. Um, Darwin's theory um, of evolution by natural selection takes a lot of different biological areas and has provided a source of a lot of questions that are still being explored. And as we are still seeing today, there is more to be done um, to better describe um, what we currently know as evolution. So, sorry. Um, so here, um, just observations. Um, individuals in a population do vary in terms of their genetic characteristics, um, and they produce more offspring than the environment can support. As a result, those that are more well suited for that environment are going to produce more offspring than other individuals. And because those alleles are the ones that are being passed on, those favorable traits are going to accumulate over time in a population.